So I don't really have a set topic for tonight. I'm just going to talk and I'll find things to talk about. The first thing I want to talk about is kind of how difficult it is to talk about mental health in general. Um, I had to go to an appointment today and get assessed by someone um, about my mental health and it's basically to say that I could be classified as needing assistance to get a job because of my mental health. Um, so I had to go see them today and I always really struggle to talk to people I don't know about my mental health. I guess the good thing about these diaries is I'm more talking to myself and explaining my thoughts to myself than imagining it's anyone else I'm talking to. I'm trying to justify it to myself, I guess, if that makes any sense. Um, but other than that, I've always really struggled to talk about what's going on with my mental health. Um, in I was officially diagnosed in 2014, I think it was, but I was first put on an antidepressant in 2000 and early 2013. Um, that was, yeah, year eight was around the time I started cutting and that was kind of when we knew something wasn't 100% right. Um, at that time, I didn't know how to talk about it. Um, then I went to go and see my doctor and I kind of started being able to open up and talk about it. And then some things were said to me by my mum and my sister that made me shut down. And I don't hold what they said against them or anything. I think when you look at a 13-year-old who, like me, I was a bit of an attention seeker. I can admit that. Um, that's just what they thought it was. And so their comments lined up with what they believed I was doing, which was just trying to get attention. And so I try not to hold it against them because I now recognise, or they now recognise the severity of it. And I think if they had their time over again and they knew the severity, they wouldn't say what they said to me. Um, and the comments were along the lines of, I remember one time my sister and I had a fight and she ended the argument with, oh, are you going to go tell your doctor this is why you're depressed because we have fights, everyone has fights, you need to get over it. And in my head I was kind of like, well, no, that's not why I'm depressed. Like, yes, I get upset when we have fights, but it's not the reason I believe I'm depressed. And again, I think mum said something along very similar lines of, the feelings I was experiencing were more lined up with hormonal feelings than genuine, genuine mental health problems. Um, and I put a post on my Reddit the other day and it basically said, it, it had the basic gist of when you come out to your family, when you're kind of that young teenager and try to talk about what you believe are mental health problems and they come back with saying, oh, it's just hormones. And I'm definitely not the only one that experienced that. I guess I was very lucky that even though they kind of had those comments, they still allowed me to go and see a doctor to talk about it. Uh, whereas I know some people, they try to talk to their families and their families dismiss it so much that they don't ever get the professional help they need. I was lucky in that although they didn't quite believe the severity of it, they didn't muck around with it either. They, they, they knew it was something, especially with the cutting, they knew it was something that needed to be looked into. Um, and so around that time that those comments were made, I weaned myself off the antidepressant. I don't remember what kind of antidepressant was. For, I even have like a gut feeling. I've never looked it up because I can't remember what it was, that it might have even been a placebo because... I was so young and now, and I was able to wean myself off it so easily, but if I tried to wean myself off my medication now, I'd go batshit and say, like, uh, there was a couple days when I was in hospital in 2018 that I didn't take my medication. And this was the hospital trip that was at the hospital that scared me. And I think me being off my medication also contributed to my feelings about the hospital. Um, but it was horrific. I've never felt... It, it felt like everything was out to get me and I became very paranoid. Um, but I can go into a more detailed explanation about that hospital visit in a moment. So uh, after the comments were made, I weaned myself off the medication. 
and basically said, no, I'm fine. Everything's all good. Sorry. Oscar, can you stop licking me, please? Stop. Thank you. Sorry, that's... You won't. He's not stopping. Hey. Stop it. Good boy. <laughs> oh, don't you just love little puppy dogs who don't know what personal space is? Huh? Especially these two are so spoiled. They sleep in my bed and they take up so much room that I'm hanging like off the bed because they're taking up the whole other side. It's a double bed. It's not like it's a small single bed and there's not a lot of room. I oh, don't look so cute, but they just, they love to take up all the room. Stop it. Go away. Go. Shoo. Stop licking. It's annoying. Play with Bibu. Oh God. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, but I love my two little boys. Anyway. As I was saying, uh, weaned myself off the medication, uh, didn't believe I needed to take it, convinced mum, dad, my sister that I didn't need to take it, I convinced my doctor I didn't need to take it, and I think I went on again at once more, and again weaned myself off it because comments were made, and that kind of led to, I don't know if this was the worst point, but this was kind of the breaking point, was 2016. So in 2016 is when my mental health became its absolute worst. It's also when I started on the medication I'm taking now. Now, with this medication, with antidepressants, they can sometimes... I don't know how to, how to put this string of words together. They can make you more suicidal if you're not on the right dosage, and that's what I experienced. Uh, I remember having a friend at the time comment that my mental health seemed to be getting worse the longer I was on the antidepressants than rather get, rather than getting better. Uh, so I guess that kind of tells you that, you know, they, they can be good for you, but if you're not on the right dosage, it can be a living hell trying to figure out where you're meant to be. I've talked to other people that have been on antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications and they can all confirm that probably the times you feel worse about yourself is when you're trying to figure out what your brain needs to feel better in regards to the medication oh my god stop go away shoot go lick boo leave me alone oh god <laughs> um so yeah 2016 I've talked about kind of all the other things that went on there uh especially in regards to my self-confidence in and boys um I was very self-destructive and that led me to and I've told and I've said about how I'd planned on committing my suicide but then I broke down before it happened that led me to going into hospital um hospital was Oscar I swear to god Hospital was okay. It was, it's the best hospital experience I've had out of all of them. Um, but, you know, I was the youngest there. I think the next one was like 18 or 19 years old. And the ones that were kind of around that younger end of the scale left very shortly after I started staying there. So I was pretty much alone. Um, and it, it, was, it was scary. You know, uh, the one I went to was about an over an hour's drive away. Uh, so it's not like it was close to my home where my parents could come and visit me on Saturday and Sunday and things like that. They could only come on one day of the weekend. And then for the other six days, it was only phone calls that I could uh, take with them. And that was really hard, but I was... I think I was in such a bad place that for a while I forgot how much I missed them because I was so determined on trying to get better because I was in such a bad place that even though those sad feelings of missing them were bad feelings, they were kind of pushed behind other bad feelings. Um, we did a lot of group sessions and that kind of helped me be able to start talking about my depression, especially with my parents. Um, they also did a session where... Uh, they were brought into like a parent group session and I don't know exactly what was talked about. They've never come and told me everything that was mentioned. They've kind of kept that to themselves. But they came out more understanding and more... I don't want to say better equipped because no, they don't know how to deal with this. And that was kind of the point of the group session from my understanding was you want to help your child 
get through it but in the end you're not a you're not a doctor or a psychologist you don't have the skills to be able to help them through this the best thing you can do is ask for help from a professional and get your child the right type of help um but yeah so I was in there for about three weeks I think it was meant to be a six week stay and the reason I left was it was Christmas it was coming up to Christmas and they wanted to take me out from Christmas Eve to Boxing Day so I could have the whole of Christmas with my family. And the hospital said no, that they couldn't release me. Um, so when I found that out, that was kind of when the separation anxiety came roaring, came, yeah, I can't speak tonight, kind of roared its ugly head and pushed past all the other feelings I was having. And I remember one night I went and hid because there were about three different community rooms I kind of took over one of them because towards the end of my stay I became very antisocial, and I and I stopped going to groups and I would just kind of lock myself or well not lock there wasn't a lock hide myself away in this uh, little room that was around the corner at the end of a hallway and I'd just spend my entire day in there and I wouldn't leave to go eat I wouldn't leave to go to group sessions I'd only get up and take my medication and I'd go to bed and that was it. I wouldn't do anything else during the day. And that was probably the last four days that I was there that I did that. Um, so in the end, I wasn't having, wasn't progressing any further. So what was the point in staying if I was basically just going to refuse to continue to help myself? If I wasn't going to go to group and I wasn't going to do anything, what was the point of staying there? So they signed me out. I think it was the day... Was it Christmas Eve or maybe the day before Christmas Eve? Christmas Eve Eve. Um, and yeah, that was the end of my first hospital stay. And it was tough coming back home and having to get used to things again. Um, when I came back home, I didn't trust myself with my medication. What mum would do is she would hide it from me. And I would have to go and say, you know, I'm ready to take my medication. She would make me wait around the corner and she went and got it from wherever its hiding spot was. Um, and she'd watch me take it and watch and make sure that I was doing the right thing. Um, we have a double story house, so I would sleep upstairs with my parents in the spare room that's kind of next to them. Because I didn't want to be alone. I, I couldn't, I was too scared of what I would do if I was alone by myself with my medication uh, so that kind of happened for the next couple months I think until maybe even a bit after I went back to school I think I was back to school for a little bit before I came, kind of transitioned back downstairs into my own bedroom um, and I've talked about year 12 and what a, wasn't as bad as year 11 but it was still a pretty shitty year and, and it's more of a shitty year because of things that I did uh, more than anything else. It's one of those years I deeply regret. As I've said before, I'll say it a million times. If I could redo one year in my life, it'd be year 12. I was a really shitty person for different reasons in year 12 than what I was in different in year 11. Um, so yeah, I started kind of opening up and talking to my parents a bit more about what was going on. And time progressed. And it's the end of the year and it's formal. And I've talked about this as well went to formal two days later so I think it was the 17th of November because it was the day before my sister's birthday I swallowed a bunch of pills to try and kill myself um went to hospital for that and it wasn't something I'd been planning like even when I'm having like good mental health periods I still have at least one thought during the day of you should kill yourself um, at the moment, I find when I'm about to go to sleep in bed, as I close my eyes, I have thoughts of killing myself. Uh, just my, my brain basically saying you should just kill yourself. And it's, it's really weird because the difference between me doing it now, like my brain telling me now kill yourself and maybe a month or two ago when I was having bad mental health is I can push those thoughts aside and go, they're just thoughts. Whereas about a month or two ago when I'm having bad mental health, I want, I know I'm not going to, but I want to act on them. Like, I more fantasize about them more, I plan out things. 
Um, one of the reasons I had to leave my previous job is I would have to catch a train into work every day. And when I was going through my bad mental health periods, it would have been very easy for me. And I constantly thought about it just to fall onto the tracks. But one of the reasons I don't want to do that is, again, my dad used to be a funeral director and he's seen what it does when when you kill yourself uh, by a train. And if I ever kill myself, I don't want someone else to think it's their, their fault. So like the train driver or a car driver or anything like that because I've thought about jumping into traffic. I don't want anyone else to ever feel that if they hadn't been there driving the train or driving their car, that I would still be alive. Um, that's always kind of a decision I've made. Uh, I still I still have thoughts about it, but I know that's not the way I want to go. I never want someone to feel like they had a hand in my death. I know, I know with suicide, your family and friends may feel like they've had a hand, but I don't want anyone for it to be someone's driving that's the reason like it was their car I chose to jump jump in front of no I just I don't want to do that to them because I can't imagine if I was in the car and uh someone jumped in front of me and I killed them I can't imagine what that would do to me so I never ever ever want to do that to someone else um so the suicide attempt in 2017 yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't planned. I was literally, I think I've said this before, I, I repeat myself a lot in case you can't tell yet. I was sitting on the end of the bed and I was crying and I was just looking at my medication. I was going, do it, just fucking do it. And so I did. And yeah, it was a very dumb thing that I did. I, I don't want to say instantly regret it because it was probably when I was in hospital sitting with my parents waiting to get admitted that I was starting to really feel like I was regretting it. Um, cause you know, if you take medication and, and a lot of it and it doesn't kill you, it can really mess you up in different ways. It can cause brain damage, uh, kidney failure, uh, all these different issues that won't kill you, but can really mess you up for life. Um, so I spent 24 hours in the hospital um honestly one of the most boring things I wasn't allowed to have my phone by my parents and just waiting there to be kind of discharged is the most boring thing it's also kind of interesting to people watch if you've ever been kind of in that I wasn't in the ER but like the waiting room where people getting um discharged and everything like that it's really interesting to watch how some of them react I remember there was a woman that came in I was waiting there for maybe an hour and she had a phone and a laptop and all these different things and she was complaining to me about how boring it was and I was like okay I'm gonna close the curtain now because I don't want to talk to you um there were people there there was one guy that I think he had done something illegal because he wasn't allowed security had to be there with him the whole time and he wanted to go outside and have a smoke and he was getting really angry when the nurses were like no we're not allowed to let you outside you have to stay in the room and so it was, I just feel really bad. I, like nurses and doctors cop a lot of shit. And if you ever want to see how much they cop it, just go sit, sit in one of those rooms for, for 12 hours and watch all the entitled people come and go thinking that they're more important. You know, I always see comments on Facebook of people being like, oh, the hospital is so busy and I've had to wait eight hours and I was in immense pain and I get it. My sister's had to go to hospital with her endometriosis and she feels like she's dying and she's had to wait for so many hours because she's not priority. The person who is priority, and again, this is close to my heart, is the guy that's dying in the back room. Yes, he just got there and you've been sitting there for six hours, but you know what? If they don't treat him right away, he's going to die. And that was my dad when he had his seven heart attacks. If they didn't treat him, if he had to wait like everyone else, he would have been dead. So unless you're dying, you may feel like you're dying, but they're going to assess you and they're going to put you on a priority list. And if it's something you can get through, no matter how painful it is, you're not going to be on the top of the list. The people that are dying are going to be at the top of that list. 
And so you've always got to kind of make a decision on whether or not hospital is the correct place to go. Um, this is my little soap box moment. I really don't like when parents bring in their like children toddlers and the toddlers or the child's just got a cough and they act like their child's dying. You could have waited until you took them to the doctor tomorrow. If it was that of much of an emergency, look at which doctors open early in the morning and be there as soon as the door opens. You should only go to the emergency room for me absolutely necessary I've only ever been there in the emergency room twice and it was when I dislocated my knee that's a fun story I get to tell one day and when I tried to commit suicide those are the only two times I've ever been in the emergency room in a hospital and it was two things that needed to be treated they needed to, to reset my knee and they needed to make sure there was no ligament damage and they needed to make sure that my kidneys weren't going to shut down and I wasn't going to have uh, brain issues because of the medication I tried to kill myself with. Uh, person in the back who's had a really bad cough for the past couple days, you can wait. And that sounds really cruel because sometimes, again, you can be in a lot of pain. My sister's been there and she has to wait because they know she's not going to die from her pain. So she's got to keep waiting until it's her turn. She gets She gets really sick of it too and I get it. But there's a lot of people who seem to want to go to the emergency room over the smallest things. And that's the kind of people I don't approve of. You know, we've had to ask my sister, can you wait until the doctor's tomorrow? Or no, I haven't had to ask her, but my mum's had to go. Can you wait until you see the doctor tomorrow? Because going to the emergency room, it's going to take a long time. Um, so can you wait or are you in dire need of having to go to the hospital? And you know, when you're in a lot of pain, it is a tough decision to make because you feel like you can't wait. You feel like you're, you're dying. And so of course that's the decision you're going to have to make. Um, I kind of went off way off track there. Um, so suicide attempt again, I kind of started shutting down talking to my parents because obviously they weren't they weren't happy. Like, what, when your child attempts suicide and they live a good life, I've never, never lived a bad life. I've never gone hungry. I've, I've never not had a roof over my head. So when your child seemingly lives a good life and yet they want to kill themselves, you kind of go, well, why? And I get that. And even I can't answer sometimes why I want to kill myself. I don't see a logical reason of why I want to kill myself. And, you know... It's tough. And that's one thing I also struggle to talk about. And struggle, and that's another reason I struggle to admit I have mental health problems. Because I have no reason to. There's people out there that go through daily hardships. That are homeless. Um, that had, have to decide whether or not to feed themselves or feed their children. Uh, who have all these medical problems. And yet they go through daily life and they don't want to kill themselves. So why, why do I? I've got nothing severely wrong with me I've got an amazing family who supports me and yet it's a thought I constantly have and I just can never explain why and I always feel incredibly guilty about it and I think that's another reason I struggled to come out and talk about things is because I do feel guilty and when I admit to someone especially psychologists because they see they see the worst of the worst. They they see people they see see children that have been severely abused. The, the one I'm going to at the moment is also a family psychologist, and you know, in her room, she's got kind of the toys and the charts and things, and like, um, it would be hard having to listen to a child that's gone through so much. And I was talking to a family friend the other day and she works at a school that's kind of an impoverished area and she said they have kindergartners who cut themselves and kind of go, what the hell has happened to that poor child? And it makes me feel really guilty that I've never had anything severely bad happen to me. I have no cause for this. And, you know, I, I kind of have to come to terms with that sometimes <sighs> sometimes there's not an explanation you know um one of the sayings I use that's kind of in conjunction with the way I feel is along the lines of if you break your leg 
and someone walks up to you and says, well, there's people that don't have any legs, you shouldn't be feeling any pain, that doesn't take the pain away. All it does is make you feel guilty for the pain you're feeling. It's the equivalent of walking up to someone with mental health issues who seemingly has a good life and going, you shouldn't have depression or anxiety, you shouldn't want to kill yourself because there's um, a homeless person who doesn't want to kill themselves. In, it just it just makes you feel really guilty. And it's it's more social media that I find. I don't think I've ever actually have someone come up to me and say, you don't deserve to have depression. I've had people question why I have depression, but I've never had someone come up right out and say that I don't, I yeah. It's, it's more social media, I feel. Um, especially I follow this sub on Reddit. It's called r slash I'm 14 and this is deep. And it's basically just making fun of 14-year-olds who post really uh, what they think is deep sta statements about society or love. And the joke is, well, you can't know what you're talking about. You're 14. And there seems to be a lot of, su um, lot of posts that do uh, with, to do with depression and things. And... You know, I have a good laugh, but at the same time, occasionally, even though I'm not 14, I do take some of them on board with me. Like, again, it's that thing of you're too young um, you're, or you're a teenager. It's just hormones. It's not depression. And yes, there are some people, especially teenage girls, that jump to the conclusion of having mental health issues too quickly I don't believe in self-diagnosis. Um, so if you have not been diagnosed by a doctor and you're going around and saying you have depression, then yes, a part of me will kind of be like, well, how do you know for a fact? That's different if your family doesn't believe you and you have not been able to go and get diagnosed. I still I still kind of don't believe in self-diagnosing, uh, self but... Um, you know, how can you get diagnosed if you never go to the doctor? So I sometimes just take some of those posts on board and I just, I'm always very scared that because I'm so young, I will be, I will be judged. Um, it's, it's weird and it's very hard as a 19 year old because I've had people that I know that have depression and anxiety and they have it for a legitimate reason. They've had something horrible go wrong in their lives and we talk about it and I sit there and when it's my turn to kind of explain why I have depression and anxiety, I've got nothing. You know, they've been hurt really badly. I never have. Uh, they, they've suffered all forms of abuse. I never have. Uh, they grew up homeless. I didn't do that. So it's just, it's something that's just a bit hard at times. And that's kind of why I also find it hard to talk to psychologists, psychiatrists, etc. Because I know that they've seen the worst of the worst. I know that the people they talk to have it really bad. And then I come in and I'm like, I want to kill myself. Well, why? I don't have a reason. And that sounds completely ridiculous to me. But also logically, if someone came up to me, like if it was one of my family members and they came up to me and they said, I want to kill myself. And I said, is there a reason? They said, no, I just feel this way and I don't know why. I wouldn't get why they would feel stupid. I'm a lot harsher of a critic to myself than I am to anyone else. If anyone else came up with my kind of thoughts and feelings, and again, this is a trick my psychologist has taught me to use. If I, if they said the things that I say about myself to me about themselves, if you kept, kept in time then, I would think that they're being overly harsh and critical of themselves. And I'd be going, you kind of need to, you need to chill. You don't need to be this harsh on yourself. And yet I constantly am that harsh on myself. Um, so I get, I get it. I really, I always believe that you should seek help. For a long time, I refused to see psychologists and psychiatrists because up until the one that I've been seeing recently, it was either that I didn't stick around with them long enough or they just weren't good that we never actually looked at changing the way my brain functions. 
uh, the one I'm looking at at the moment. Um, I think we're doing some sort of, I can't remember what it's called. I've got it written down somewhere. Some sort of, we're doing like three different steps of ways to change my brain patterns. And the first one, she kind of might work. The second one will definitely work. And if it doesn't, on the slim chance that 1% it doesn't work, we've got option number three to go with. Um, yeah, it's, it's little, it's little things. It's coming to terms with, I'm not at fault for having depression. I haven't chosen to have it. You know, I can recognise that, yes, people have it worse, but I shouldn't make myself feel guilty for people having it worse than me. Um, again, I think I've repeated myself a million different times in the same way, so I'm going to end this one here. And whoever watches this, I hope you have a great day, great night.